so it's it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Claudia Misale and Dan Milroy, who are going to give us a talk on the Kubernetes plugin for um, uh, to the the flux that that uses the Fluxion um, component of the Kubeflux. Uh, framework in order to uh, use Kubernetes with the uh, hyperconverged or the converged uh, flux scheduler. So Claudia is a research staff member at IBM's TJ Watson uh, Research Center in New York, uh, where she's focusing on uh, using Kubernetes in IBM's cloud uh, computing uh, cluster. And she's interested in HPC projects that uh, are aimed at trying to integrate HPC workloads with Kubernetes. And that uh, involves sort of this very hot area of uh, more tightly integrating Kubernetes uh, with uh, batch scheduling. And uh, Dan is a uh, computer scientist at the uh, Center for Applied Scientific Computing at, at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And he's one of the core developers of Flux. And so he's a great asset to talk to us about the um, working components of Flux. So please uh, indulge us. All right, thank you. I'm going to start to share my screen so you can see the slides. All right, hopefully that is the correct screen that's being shared. Can everyone see that all right? Looks yeah. good. All right, well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm gonna be presenting the background and introduction to the flux and fluxion portion of this talk. Um, and Claudia is then going to present the second part. Um, we're speaking on behalf of our collaborators at the laboratory, um, Red Hat and IBM for today's data seminar. So I want to provide a little bit of motivation for this talk and emphasize really that cloud is an ever more dominant market force in computing, um, and it's influencing HPC pretty profoundly. As evidence, uh, public cloud revenue is forecast to achieve about $400 billion by the end of this year and uh, approximately $500 billion by the end of 2023. So we can contrast that with HPC spending minus the cloud component of that, which is expected to reach about $32 billion by the end of this year. And that gap is expected to increase. So um, since cloud is economically favored, it's going to continue to generate computing innovations, which HPC will both need and very likely want to integrate in the future. So when we talk about cloud in this presentation, as the title suggests, we're focusing on Kubernetes, which is the de facto container orchestration framework. Um, there's tremendous interest and participation in Kubernetes. Um, the flagship conference in particular for Kubernetes is KubeCon plus uh, Cloud Native Conference North America, which last year saw almost 18,000 attendees, which was an increase of about 350% from 2017. So um, not only is there a tremendous amount of interest, but the interest is growing very rapidly. And you can also see that fact in the number of open source developers that contribute to the project, which may have reached um, over a thousand at this point. So from the enterprise standpoint, there's also an increased emphasis on efficiency as well. So that's evidenced by the creation of kind of a sector called FinOps, which can tie executive bonuses to cloud cost control. Now, from the enterprise user side, there's also mounting interest in um, bringing the benefits of cloud together with high performance computing uh, for applications in the financial, um, automotive and telecom sectors. From the research side, there's increasing interest in bringing the advantages of containerization and cloud into HPC. Um, you can see that through the popularity of some of the SC workshops like um, containers in HPC and Canopy. So at Lawrence Livermore, uh, strategic workflows like Ample or the Atom Modeling Pipeline already exhibit the need for converged computing. You can see in this architectural diagram that this is kind of siloed in the sense that you have a Docker Kubernetes cluster on the left and you have your HPC cluster on the right. And there are some connections in between the two of them. And these relative sizes of the diagrams belie the actual sizes of the physical resources. Um, in this case, the HPC cluster is massively larger than the dedicated Docker Kubernetes cluster. So as I said, a lot of these components are siloed and they're they're connected uh, via network, but there is kind of um, one exception to that, and that's RabbitMQ that kind of bridges these two silos a little bit more. Um, 
So RabbitMQ is a server client model where the clients in this case reside on the HPC cluster. And that kind of hints at a new extent of convergence that we expect to see. So you can, you can wonder what's going to happen when the number of workers overwhelm the capabilities or the hardware resources that are dedicated to the servers on a small kind of Kubernetes cluster. Um, we're also seeing um, or so I should say, this use case is actually um, a compelling use case for bringing Kubernetes and HPC clusters together on the same physical resources. And we're also seeing interest in running more compute intensive workloads like um, AI and ML within Kubernetes itself. So at the laboratory, other workloads are, are demanding cloud technologies within HPC, such as the Merlin workflow coordinator, um, the radical pilot, um, program, which are performing COVID-19 related research. There's also traumatic brain injury research and data, and data management and uh, visualization frameworks. So despite the existing use cases, a recent laboratory application survey determined that um, currently fewer than 10% of apps at the lab make use of the cloud, but up to 73% may adopt cloud in the future, which is indicative of a tremendous amount of latent interest. So to facilitate the adoption of cloud and to make it high performance, um, we need to integrate it with some HPC technologies such as HPC resource and job management software into a more coherent um, converged computing environment. So RJMS and Kubernetes are really complementary technologies. That's the way that we see it. They both have disadvantages and their advantages complement the other's disadvantages. So from the RJMS side, um, resource job management software really aren't designed to orchestrate containers in their networking. They can start and stop containers, um, but in terms of actually full lifecycle orchestration, declarative orchestration, um, and um, managing the software-defined networking, that's really not something they're designed to do. They're also not designed from the get-go for elasticity. Now, on the other hand, Kubernetes has advantage, disadvantages for uh, converged computing. It's designed in, um, for microservices or loosely coupled apps. Uh, second, the kube scheduler or the default scheduler is extremely limited. It doesn't really have any true queuing built into it. Um, and it's designed for really simplistic hardware requests. So this inadequate um, resource expression um, is really inefficient and it's really not sufficient for high performance computing where we want to know all the details possible about a um, hardware platform, its topology, et cetera, in order to squeeze as much performance as possible out of it. Now, there are, there are, par there are projects, and, and Claudia is probably going to mention one of them briefly, uh, like node feature discovery that's actually enhancing the resource expression within Kubernetes, but by default, um, that's not really the emphasis of it. So they are complementary, um, and to further converge computing, we're actually going to need to improve how they coordinate and communicate within between themselves. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, and, and talk about the current state of RJMS and how Flux and Fluxion fit into that. So there are significant trends toward uh, complex workflows, um, extreme resource heterogeneity, convert and converge computing, which are uh, currently rendering traditional workload managers increasingly ineffective. Um, there are five challenges uh, regarding this. And the first is the co-scheduling challenge, uh, which is what we're calling uh, where complex workflows require component coupling and co-scheduling of different types of hardware, um, such as CPUs and GPUs, for example. Uh, the second is the throughput challenge, where uncertainty quantification, for example, or other ensemble-based techniques can submit um, tens of thousands of short-running jobs, which can overwhelm traditional HPC or GMS. Now, third is the job communication and coordination challenge. Um, in this case, workflows depend on data transfer between various components within a framework. Um, fourth is the portability challenge. Um, in order to make sure that an application runs across multiple different platforms, um, application designers, engineers, and scientists um, typically need to port an application to a large variety of RGMS. And uh, finally, we're starting to see extreme uh, resource heterogeneity, which is really stretching or exceeding the resource modeling capabilities of traditional HPC RGMS. So Flux actually solves or addresses all five of these key technical problems. Um, as was introduced before, uh, Flux is an open source project. It's an active development. Um, you, you can see this on the GitHub Flux framework organization. It's composed of multiple sub projects. Uh, such as uh, Flux Core and SCED, which is also known as Fluxion. 
Um, there are over 15 contributors to the project, including many of the original engineers behind the um, between the behind the Swarm project. Um, now, Flux has two modes. One is the single user mode, which has been around for over three years at this point. And there is the multi-user mode or system instance. Um, and this is actually going to be the plan of record RJMS for the LLNL El Capitan Exascale system. Now, Flux is fully hi hierarchical in terms of its architecture, and it uses this foundation to solve three primary deficiencies in the conventional RJMS approach. Um, first, we have full workflow enablement support. Um, Flux achieves this through resource subdivision. In the diagram at the left, um, you can see a top level Flux instance, which instantiates one Flux instance per node, which then in turn instantiates lower level Flux instances at the CPU or core level, for example. Um, this allows a sub resource manager per subdivision with service special specialization at each level. And what that really means is that you can customize the scheduler so you can have a different scheduling algorithm at each one of these uh, levels, for example. Um, Flux can also manage resources from almost anywhere, including bare metal resources, uh, virtual machines in the cloud, et cetera. One of the major advantages uh, afforded by Flux in this sense is that workflows only need to program to Flux, since Flux can run inside of Slurm, LSF, or other RGMS. Finally, uh, Flux provides rich and well-defined interfaces to facilitate communications between workload or workflow components or other third-party API clients. And this is really key converge for converged computing, and this is something that KubeFlux makes use of. Flux also pioneers and uses graph-based scheduling uh, to manage complex combinations of extremely heterogeneous and diverse resources. Traditional resource models and their managers really can't cope with extreme heterogeneity um, because they were designed when systems were node-centric and the data structures that they use to define or model the resource types are very simplistic. However, Flux or Fluxion Scheduler uses a directed graph of resources, um, which consists of a set of ver vertices which are the resources themselves, and edges, which define relationships between these resources, which kind of elevates resource relationships to an, onto an equal footing with the resources themselves. Now, directed graphs can express complex scheduling logic without changing the scheduler code. And another advantage of using directed graphs is that they facilitate elasticity or resource dynamism um, through well-defined graph editing procedures, which ends up being another tremendous advantage for converged computing. So there is still a significant gap to be closed be between Kubernetes and HPC RGMS before we have kind of fully converged computing environments. On the top branch here, this diagram, um, our HPC R and RGMS generally need more cloud capabilities to allow them to integrate with the bottom branch. So there's increasing cloud readiness moving from Slurm to LSF and then to Flux on the right. On the cloud orchestration side on the bottom, you have progress in terms of increased uh, scheduling sophistication and performance and efficiency. So moving from basic bare bones Kubernetes to um, third party application plugins such as Volcano, which integrates batch capabilities. Um, and there's also Poseidon or Firmament, which uh, provides sophisticated or more sophisticated scheduling capabilities. The KubeFlux plugin uh, for Kubernetes is really the first major step or one of the first major steps in bringing these two branches together into a unified converged computing environment. So I am going to uh, turn things over to Claudia so she can talk about the details about KubeFlux. Yep, let me share. So I hope you're seeing the right screen, not the presenter one. Is that right? Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so I'll start from uh, the very last point, like uh, the where and how we are trying to bring together the best of both worlds, uh, where in, in our specific use case, 
uh, those are, uh, of course, Kubernetes slash OpenShift because of our collaboration with uh, Red Hat. So we, we uh, I will touch some of these points uh, later in the presentation, like also where other components that come from uh, the OpenShift uh, team that we are integrating into this project. And of course, we are integrating Flux too. Um, so uh, as Dan showed in the previous uh, slides, Flux is not just about scheduling. So it's not just a scheduler. It has a lot of components in it. And we are uh, using specifically for the plugin scheduler, the scheduling component that uh, I think it, it might be referred as Fluxion somewhere in the slides. So if you see that, that means that I'm talking about the uh, scheduler component in Flux. Uh, for the other um, capabilities that Flux has like workflow manager, management, accounting and all other um, things that would make Flux a uh, resource manager job scheduler that's uh, still out of the scope of the uh, current implementation uh, because of I would I mean it's not really limitation of the uh, of the framework that allows us to implement it as a plugin scheduler for Kubernetes but because that's definitely a, a uh, bigger effort that doesn't touch only scheduling, but also some a lot of other things into Kubernetes and to bring all of those things together, the work is um, is quite uh, quite large. Uh, so um, uh, I I might assume that everyone in the call has heard at least once about Kubernetes. So to make sure that uh, we are using the same terminology, I will just give a very, very quick overview of uh, Kubernetes. Um, so it is a container orchestrator. That's how it's uh, uh, called by uh, Kubernetes community itself, but by everyone else. So the orchestration of, of, of containers, that's what it what it, it's really uh, implemented for. So it manages uh, container lifecycle and uh, overall contain certain uh, types of container workloads and uh, and services. So it along with the uh, containers life cycle, so creation and uh, cleaning up resources after uh, a container has been executed. It also the the um, the, the the one of the main capabilities of Kubernetes that is uh, that makes it not not just a container uh, executor engine uh, is that it. It also creates and manages uh, networking storage, but also computing, compute and memory resources that containers uh, need to, to have in order to execute. So that, in, for instance, if containers need to talk to each other because they implement a service that has different uh, components, uh, the, the networking and or if they communicate uh, through storage, all these things are um, it is possible to deploy them very, very, very easily in a very simplified way with Kubernetes. Some options are uh, more efficient than others, more secure than others, but in general, all those things are very hyper simplified so that uh, anyone can really deploy any kind of, of uh, uh, microservice. So uh, another strong point in Kubernetes for this kind of workload that it deploys is that it manages, uh, it, it's designed for microservices. So it's not for, I mean, you can actually deploy any kind of application that runs in container, of course, but um, all the components that are made available, uh, they really target microservices. But um, given the, uh, the architecture of Kubernetes. So if you're familiar with that or not, doesn't really matter. Uh, so the, the, the main brain, the API server and 
the its memory, the etcd cluster, that is where all the states of the uh, application running and the cluster itself is stored. Uh, so all of that is done by objects, API objects that are, I mean, you can see that as instances of, I don't know, a class uh, in Java or C++. Um, so all those objects, uh, so there are a certain type that are a certain set that is predefined. So that comes with Kubernetes, but you can, those uh, objects can be extended or you can create your own uh, API objects. And this is um, very powerful because it allows to implement new um, uh, objects or um, even kind of workloads objects, if we want to move on that direction, workflows, sorry, uh, objects. And if, of course, once you uh, add those new APIs, you also need to implement something that understands these new objects and will do and react in base of the, uh, in base, based on how those objects are being created or, the, or changed. So it's like a state machine that manages state of objects. And th this is really powerful because you can really implement uh, and use Kubernetes as a platform to manage different kinds of uh, objects, application and workloads. And the basic uh, com compute resource in uh, Kubernetes is uh, the container. Uh, but on, on, on top of it, a container is wrapped in this basic unit of computation that is the pod. Um, the pod can run actually one or more containers within it. And those containers are co-located and co-scheduled because they are physically in the same uh, pod object. Uh, so where this pod is being scheduled, all, all those containers are running in the same, uh, on the same node and they share the resources. So if they, if this pod needs uh, a volume where to read and store data, this volume is being accessible from all of the containers within that pod. Uh, same for networking, that's all shared. They all share the same uh, network and storage. They run in the shared context, so namespaces, C group, all the things that make the container, they all run, they all share this, uh, the, the those resources. And um, moving on a Kubernetes uh, side, rather than just what happened within a pod, um, in, in Kubernetes, there are a set of predefined uh, objects or workloads actually that you can create. Uh, these are kind of like the deployment, a daemon set, a stateful set, replica set, or even just pod or job. Uh, those are all objects that Kubernetes understands. And those are the kind of the workloads that it can uh, manage and, and uh, create scale up and down and manage if, if pods within that particular workload uh, are killed for any reason, um, or the Kubernetes infrastructure is able to recreate those pods so that the, the size of the workload that the user defined, it will still be uh, running. So the purpose of Kubernetes given, given the kind of deployment is to keep the state, the desired state, that is what the user defined, consistent with the actual state of the cluster. So it will check over time continuously if the uh, actual state of the cluster, so how many uh, pods are running, uh, if the volumes are uh, correctly being um, uh, mounted by the pods and all, the, all those kind of things. Kubernetes checks periodically if everything is consistent with what the, user, the users ask. If that's not happening, that it will take uh, actions in order to bring the actual state to the desired state. Uh, so the, Kubernetes has a, a big, uh, a large amount of uh, building blocks. Uh, 
other than the like the API server or the other software components like the kubelets or the kube proxy that they run on uh, the on the compute nodes in the cluster. Uh, the there are several software building blocks. One of those uh, control they are called controllers. So sorry, no, I didn't want to say software about controller building blocks. So the, the role of the controller is to actually look over what's happening in, in the cluster. One of those controllers is the scheduler. Uh, the name of the scheduler in Kubernetes is Kube Scheduler. Uh, I will call it either Kube Scheduler or Default Scheduler. Um, it is very, um, it, it's algorithm, if we can call it so, is a is very simple and it is very simple, uh, not because um, there was not a reason for that. I mean, it's the, the, it's scheduled. Uh, it is uh, meant to schedule microservices and to to uh, meet the the requirements for those kind of workloads. There is uh, really not much to uh, try to optimize uh, in terms of. Res uh, 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 workload allocation and resource management. So the um, the Kube scheduler what does is um, going through two different set of functions. First set of functions are the predicates. Second set of functions are the priorities. Predicates are filtering functions. So they uh, take an input the list of the compute nodes in the cluster plus what the actual, the current pod that needs to be scheduled is asking for. Uh, so given the resources asked by the pod and the current uh, list of the nodes, with the predicate, the predicate set of function will just filter the nodes that can, uh, can or cannot host that specific pod. So the initial list will be uh, pruned a little bit out from the predicates set of functions. And then the remaining uh, nodes that are uh, that can host that particular pod are uh, sorted. And the sorting happens with uh, after the set of the priorities that are applied to, to them. And those priorities are giving them a uh, score is from one to 10. Uh, all the uh, uh, priorities function are applied uh, to, um, to all of the nodes. So at the end, you will have a score. Uh, those, the scores are um, um, ordered and the node that has the highest score uh, wins the competition and will host the node. Um, so yeah, this is basically what the Coop scheduler does. And it does that for every pod, even if the pod belongs to a group of pods that would need to be scheduled all, that might need to be scheduled all together or that they belong to the same group. For instance, if you're familiar with the uh, with Kubernetes in a deployment, you know that you can have one or more pods a part of that uh, deployment. All those pods run the same container, so they are all the same. There is not heterogeneity within a particular deployment. Um, and all of those pods, even if they belong to the same, uh, let's move to this slide, yeah. So even if they belong to the same group, they are actually scheduled pod by pod. So th that's how they call it, this kind of placement. So every pod will, uh, with, with every pod, we will go through the entire list of um, uh, priorities and predicates. So if it's, there is a deployment with 10 pods, we will have uh, 10 times that the set of the two um, predicates and, pri and priorities uh, functions. So this is, um, uh, it, it is for when you deploy micro, the regular microservices in, uh, in Kubernetes, that works perfectly fine. There is actually nothing absolutely wrong with it. So it's not really a critique about the how the Kube scheduler works. Uh, so for uh, loosely coupled services, for, for the microservices, that works perfectly fine because even, I mean, that's for what Kubernetes was created. 
uh, but since now we uh, we want, we're trying to do more complicated things with Kubernetes. Uh, this start to have several uh, limitations. One of those, since I was uh, um, mentioning the example for the uh, deployment, that is a group of pods. So in that case, if we wanted to do a group uh, like gang scheduling or batch scheduling, that's not possible in Kubernetes. So th this has to be implemented on top of that. There are plenty of options to do this, uh, to do like gang scheduling. So it's not something that is uh, an unknown territory. Uh, there, are, there are also uh, other scheduler plugin for Kubernetes that do that or much larger uh, frameworks like Volcano that also allow to do batch scheduling or gang scheduling. So this is an, of course a limitation, but there are already uh, solutions uh, that uh, solve this problem. So for not feature discovery, uh, this is one of the uh, components that we are integrating also in the plugin scheduler that we're working on on Kubeplugs. So this is part of a, um, it, it is a different effort. So it's not, it, this is not because of Kubeplugs, but um, in, uh, so there's a, a team in Red Hat that is target uh, addressing how to run uh, as efficiently as possible and how to expose more information about the uh, our underlying resources in OpenShift uh, to the user so that those this information can be taken advantage of. And actually we are doing, we are taking advantage, advantage of this, this information uh, with Kubeflux. And the NFD and not feature discovery is a workload running on Kubernetes. And what it does is uh, running a daemon set. Uh, that, that means that there is a daemon running on each of the worker nodes in the OpenShift or Kubernetes cluster. And each of those daemons are scraping the uh, the, the hardware and the software too, to, um, to collect all possible information about the ha hardware and software that is available on the compute nodes. And this information is then propagated back to the API server. And uh, as of today, this information is available as, the, as a label on the Kubernetes compute node objects, but also as a custom resource definition that is a new object that can be uh, queried in, uh, in Kubernetes uh, as all the other objects like pods, jobs, anything else in, in Kubernetes. So it's pretty easy to uh, collect this information because the, the not field discovery is doing that for you. And it's also very, very easy to read back that information and integrate that into your application. And we are using that for in, in Kubeflux too, to create a richer uh, graph of the resources. Um, so there is one, um, I, I will try to go fast on, on this one. So let me move directly on in this side. Um, so how to extend Kubernetes, there, there is, uh, there are plenty of options. Uh, so in, in this graph, in one of um, the paper that we uh, wrote last year, so we tried to categorize how to implement Kubernetes and how, to, how is it possible to integrate what we do more traditional HPC scheduler or resource manager into Kubernetes. So uh, over the years, uh, Kubernetes was not, uh, especially, I mean, targeting specifically uh, scheduling in this case. Um, so there, over the years, there were different ways how you could extend Kubernetes. So all those things that you are reading here in the like loose composition and tight composition. Uh, so that's, it all exists. So it's not that even if those loose composition, some are kind of older way to extend the Kubernetes scheduler, for instance, like in a in a fork of the Kubernetes of the Kube scheduler uh, code. Um, so this is actually not anymore the preferred way to extend the scheduler, but to in, in 
extend Kubernetes in order to do more things. Uh, the admission plugin, the custom controllers and custom resource definitions, uh, those are all the, um, uh, um, the way that Kubernetes allows user to implement more, uh, more uh, a richer uh, semantic of what they, the user can do in on top of Kubernetes. And yeah, to give another um, uh, mm, to refer again to Volcano, for instance, it uses custom is a set of custom controllers, a set of custom resource definitions, some admission plugins. So that's where it belongs. Uh, in our case for uh, Kubernetes, for Kubeflux, we are using the scheduling framework that is the preferred way to extend just the, just the scheduler. So if you want to extend the scheduling capabilities without adding more, um, without adding all the possible capabilities that uh, you would need, for instance, to if we wanted to implement one-to-one -one, uh, flux on top of Kubernetes, just the scheduling framework wouldn't be enough. But since we're just using the flux scheduler uh, module, this is actually exactly perfect for uh, our uh, use case. And it is also uh, the best way to extend it because it's 100% uh, portable and you can actually run that in any Kubernetes cluster and as easy as running a pod. Uh, so this is the preferred way to extend uh, Kubernetes. So I will jump into this straight away, uh, no, into this one. Uh, so the scheduling framework is a set of uh, um, extension points that you can implement your, where you can implement your logic on top of it. So all those extension points are those little labels, the green ones and the yellow ones. So this is all, this can all be extended. And we use in particular two of the pre-filter and filter functions uh, where we actually query uh, the Fluxion the module that is actually the flux scheduler and we query it uh, every time a new uh, pod needs to be scheduled and wants to be scheduled with Kubeflux. so we get the information uh, of the what the pod uh, um, is requiring in terms of uh, resources we map this uh, into a uh, job spec that is what uh, flux understands and we query um, Fluxion that, that we use it as a library and we implemented on top of it a Golang binding so that we can query these um, C library directly from uh, Kubernetes because everything that runs in Kubernetes is Golang so we needed something that uh, could talk to Fluxion. Um, very briefly the execution flow how that works. Uh, so at startup, starting from point one, uh, Kubeflux gets the uh, information about the cluster, so all the nodes that are in the cluster, and creates the graph of the resources, the one that uh, Dan mentioned at the beginning. So it's a graph that is loaded uh, as a cluster topology in, uh, in the Kubeflux plugin. Uh, so at that point, we can initialize the uh, library that runs the, 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 the scheduler, so the flux scheduler part. Um, uh, moving to point two, when a pod uh, wants to be scheduled by using the Kubeflux scheduler, uh, the plugin is converting the pod manifest into a job spec that flux can understand and issue a match allocate um, request to the scheduler. So the scheduler will compute uh, the, these are the, the best match for that specific job. The uh, allocation result that is the node IP will be given back to the Flux plugin. And this information is reflected back to the API server. Uh, to, so on the left to the cluster. So that at that point, uh, Kubernetes can keep going with the pod actual execution that is done on the compute node that has been selected and that's issued by the um, by the kubelet. So at that point the plugin is already out of the of the story. 
So we got some results that we showed at the Canopy uh, workshop uh, at Supercomputing uh, last year, so a few months ago. Um, so we evaluated it, um, Kuflux with uh, Gromax, compared it against the uh, Kubernetes default scheduler. And so we used um, MPI, uh, the MPI operator that comes in, maybe I wrote it somewhere or maybe not. Uh, so it's Gromax is based on MPI. I'm sure everyone here knows way more than I do about Gromax. And um, we used Kubeflow, the MPI operator in that framework to run uh, Gromax on, uh, on an OpenShift cluster that we were running on uh, IBM Cloud. Uh, not huge size, just 34 nodes, but um, it, it's already good to give an idea of how things can get, uh, when and where things start to break and uh, when we move from on-premises to cloud. Um, the, the, the OpenShift cluster was distributed on three availability zones and uh, this make a difference. This makes a difference when uh, using different um, um, way of deploying the pods that we experimented on Kubeflux. So the compute nodes are not big, is uh, four virtual CPU, 16 gigabytes of memory, uh, but that was uh, good enough for, um, for our experiments because we were not really trying to optimize Gromax, but just to have a, uh, to, to see what happens when you schedule those things on the cloud. Um, so we compared Kubernetes scheduler uh, so the Kube scheduler against, uh, say, um, Kube flux in two ways. One is vanilla, so had, how, how it comes, so without any kind of optimization. And uh, another, the other uh, implementation that we did was with um, considering the um, the three availability zones. So we say we. In the uh, results, we compared the Kube flux with or without availability zone awareness. Uh, with the avail availability zone awareness, that means that we are creating a the richer topology for the cluster, and we actually kind of divide the entire OpenShift cluster into those three groups, and the scheduling. Uh, what's happening in a slightly different way. So rather than spreading across all the um, nodes that were kind of the same uh, rack level in this way, we are uh, building a topology that is uh, with like a root with three different branches. And we do a sort of packing on those uh, three uh, availability zones. Uh, we, we measure like strong scaling in terms of the, the number simulation a day, that is the uh, typical measure that's used in, uh, in Gromax. Uh, we also built a sort of per basic performance model uh, for, uh, to predict performance, uh, but that, that I would refer to the, to the paper to if you want to dig a little bit more. So at a glance, um, so once we reached the uh, so, so we on yeah let, let's uh, read the graph better so on the x axis we have the number of the MPI ranks on the uh, y axis the an average of the number simulation a day uh, so uh, the coup flux vanilla one is the one in blue the uh, coup flux with subnet awareness is the gray line and the default schedule is the orange line, the higher, the better. So a higher the number simulation of the A performs better. And we marked uh, on 32 more or less that is where the, where at that point we're starting to map more MPI ranks, so more than one MPI rank per node. So at that point, this is for every combination, for every scheduler uh, or scheduler uh, algorithm that we use um a point where performance starts to degrade a lot so that's kind of overall uh, the same everywhere uh but um what we can see that is that with with the cool flux um 
uh, the, sort of the blue line that performs, uh, outperforms both the other with subnet awareness and the default scheduler because uh, the vanilla cool flux, so the blue one tends to um, pack the nodes into a, let's say, an availability zone first. So since in this case, there, there is the entire pool of nodes is seen like a big, uh, uh, set of nodes in, belonging to the same uh, rack. This uh, this was allowing a best allocation of the pods over the the entire set of the nodes. While with the availability zone uh, awareness, this packing was kind of more similar to what Kubernetes was doing. So you can see that the lines are kind of similar to up to eight. Uh, MPI ranks, then they start to, to diverge. But anyway, this subnet awareness is not working that great either. Um, and yeah, with also with Kubeflux, uh, sorry, with uh, the default Kubernetes scheduler and the Kubeflux in the gray uh, line. Um, another thing that happened that happened in those two cases was that there is there is more oversubscription because there is more pods into a a uh, single node, uh, so that this wasn't helping performance very much. So overall, the, the takeaway is that even without doing any kind of um, optimization, it's very easy to have a kind of out of the box more than 2x speed up over the default Kubernetes scheduler. Uh, this is not because Kubernetes is, is not doing its job, it's just because Kubernetes is not implemented to address those kind of applications. So we, it, it's, um, uh, it, it is also clear that, I mean, is, is a way to also keep demonstrating the fact that you really need something better than just Kubernetes to uh, address the kind of application that are more HPC-like. So not only Gromax, uh, but also more like AI application and or machine machine learning application that uh, also need to have a better uh, allocation to uh, improve their performance. And they all, they all are moving to the cloud uh, too. So it, it is very important to um, uh, keep working on addressing the scheduling uh, gap because it is uh, one of the major points actually, other than of course, then you would have to uh, optimize the container execution, the networking and all the things, of course, they don't come 100% uh, good for free at the beginning, but the scheduling of, work, of course is something that um, helps out of the box to uh, get better performance. And I think that's the last slide.